we've been working on this new electricity unit now for three days, and we have not yet touched one mathematical problem other than adding up and dividing by two. Today we're going to see an equation, a new equation, but it's going to look a lot like an equation that you saw last year. How many people remember Newton's law of universal gravitation that we talked about last year? The law that we're going to talk about today, Coulomb's law, is real similar to that law, Newton's universal law of gravitation. Uh, that law that provided for us the force of gravity that acts between any two objects with mass. The law that we're going to look at today, called Coulomb's law, is going to provide for us the electric force between two objects with charge. So the force of attraction between opposite charges or the force of repulsion between like charges. We're going to talk about an experiment first, though before we actually talk about the law per se. This experiment is also going to remind you of a part of that law of gravitation that we looked at last year in Physics 20. I'll draw it out here um, in a bit of a simplification. If you were to perform this experiment, it would be a little bit more complicated than we're going to show you, but it gives you the gist of it. What I've drawn here now is the top of a box, or maybe it's the ceiling. It's something that a string can hang from. So a string is hanging from that ceiling, let's say. There's a rod on the end of that string. That rod has on either end of it a conducting ball. Those balls both weigh the same. They, ha they have to so that this thing is balanced, so that it doesn't tip over. We're going to charge one of those objects. We'll call it charge one. The other one doesn't matter. We could charge it if you want. You don't have to. It doesn't change the mass of it. Charge two is not going to be the other ball at the other end. Charge two is going to be my fist as I bring my fist towards it. So I'm going to bring my fist now, charge number two, towards charge number one. Can you tell me what's going to happen to charge number one as a result of bringing charge two nearby? Well, one of two things could happen. It depends. Depends on what? Depends on what kind of charge we have, right? Are they like charges or the opposite charges? If they're like charges, charge number one will be pushed away from charge number two. If they're unlike charges, it's going to be attracted. It doesn't matter. For the purposes of this experiment, it doesn't matter whether they attract or whether they repel. There's a force between them. We can measure that force. We can measure that force, how strong that force is, by looking at what we call the torsional properties of that string, the twisting properties of the string. Um, all of you, all of you when you were little kids, maybe some of you yesterday, I don't know, were at a playground sitting on a swing set and you twist that swing set around so that you can start spinning faster and faster and faster. You try to twist it as much as you can, right? At some level you know, even when you were a little kid, that the more you twist it, the more difficult it becomes to twist it. The more force is required to twist it. You could do an experiment that tested the torsional properties of that swing set, that measured how much force is required to twist it a quarter of a turn, a half a turn, three quarters of a turn, and so on. Coulomb would have done an experiment with the string to measure the torsional properties, the twisting properties of the string. He would have done an experiment that said, that, that concluded that if the string twists five degrees, this much force was applied. If it twists 15 degrees, then this much force was applied. By looking at how much the string twists when I bring my fist or charge two nearby charge one, we can measure the value of the force that exists between those two charges. The charges themselves that we're going to call Q, Q1 and Q2, they're a little bit more difficult to measure. We can measure the value of the charges now in coulombs. Coulomb couldn't do that. Coulomb had no way of determining the actual value of the charges. So what he did is found the relative value. Here's what he did. He said, look, charge number one is a charge of Q. Let's touch it against something that's neutral. It becomes a half Q. Zero and Q become a half Q. Touch it again, it becomes a quarter Q. Touch it again with a neutral object, it becomes an eighth Q, and so on. He can manipulate the value of Q without actually knowing what Q is in Coulombs. He can do that for both charge one and charge two, my fist, that's coming towards it. And finally, the easy one, the distance between the two charges, right, between my fist and charge one, we're going to call that R, and that's easily measured with a ruler or something like that. 
So we're able to perform experiments now where we're able to measure four different quantities. Kuwam's going to perform three experiments. In the first experiment, he's going to manipulate the value of Q1. He's going to change the value of Q1. He's going to keep everything else constant. Q2 and R have to be control variables. They have to stay the same through this experiment. Q1 gets manipulated, and F responds to changing Q1. When he does that, he gets a straight line. That tells him that F is directly related to Q1. In other words, as Q1 doubles, then F doubles. As Q1 gets cut by a factor of 4, then F goes down by a factor of 4. They're directly related. Next, he manipulates Q2. When he does that, he finds, sorry, he controls Q1 and R. And when he does that, he finds that, once again, we get a straight line, which means that F is directly related to Q2. In other words, as you double the charge on charge 2, the force doubles. As you increase the charge on charge 2 by a factor of 12, then the force increases by a factor of 12. That tells him that the force is directly related to Q2. Finally, he manipulates the value of R. This one gives him an odd shape. It looks like this. That tells him, by the way, he controls what? What's got to stay the same in this experiment? Yeah, Q1 and Q2. He finds the relationship here is 1 over R squared. In other words, as R goes up, F goes down. Yeah. Exponentially, in fact. He puts these together, and he gets something like this. F is related to Q1 times Q2 over R squared. So F is not equal to that mathematical relationship, but it's related to that mathematical relationship. If it's related to that relationship, then it's got to be equal to a constant times that relationship. Sometimes I call that constant a fudge factor. In other words, hey, look, we know it's clearly related to Q1, Q2 over R squared. we got to just come up with a number to put in front of it to make it equal, not just related, to make it equal. That number is a constant called K, Coulomb's constant. And it has a value of 8.99 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. This equation should remind you of an equation we did last year in Physics 20. Once again, Newton's law of universal gravitation. There's a lot of similarities between these two laws. There's differences as well, but there's a lot of similarities. Look at the structure of the equation. They look almost the same. One uses charge, one uses mass. The constant, I don't know if you remember this from physics 20, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Constants are way different. Which one do you think is a bigger force? Which one do you think is more significant in the universe than the other. We always think of gravity as being a big force. It isn't. Gravity is a ridiculously small force in this grand scheme of things. The electrostatic force is almost always bigger than the gravitational force. One final summary here, just to compare those two laws that we learned about last year in Physics 20 and just today in physics 30, Coulomb's law and Newton's law of universal gravitation. 
Uh, the relationship is are both what we call inverse square relationships. That comes down to the equation, right? F is equal to kq1, q2 over r squared. The force is inversely related to the square of the distance in both cases. The magnitude of the force well, with the discussion we just had a minute ago, we saw that the electric force is going to be, in a, all other things being equal, way bigger than the force of gravity. Look at the constants, 10 to the 9 and 10 to the minus 11. You stick a 10 to the 9 in front of a few variables, stick a 10 to the minus 11 in front of a few variables, this one's going to be a bigger force, way bigger. And finally, the direction. Well, Coulomb's law is an electric force which can be attractive or repulsive depending upon what kind of charge you have. You only have one kind of mass, it's positive mass. You can only get a force of attraction with gravity because there's one kind of mass. With two kinds of charge, you can get attractive or repulsive.